Good morning and welcome to the 2015 Whitehead Colloquium. It's a pleasure to see you all here uh, for what is a cherished annual event for us. This is our 21st colloquium. We're entering our third decade of this event with all of you here. It's wonderful. We have a very special day planned for you. It's a day that signifies the essence of what makes Whitehead Institute an extraordinary place to do science. It's a place where the world's most ambitious and curious scientific minds have the freedom to ask and answer the most important questions in biology, questions that will undoubtedly change the future of human health. As many of you know, um, I came to Whitehead Institute. I guess I should introduce myself. I'm David Page, director here at Whitehead. I came to Whitehead in 1984 well, uh, six weeks after I graduated from medical school, and I was all of 28 years old, uh, and I've never left for good reason. Uh, there's no better place in the world to do curiosity-driven biological research. Time and again, Whitehead is at the top of the heap. When you compare pound for pound the strength of our scientific output with other institutes in the world. So take, for example, the recent statistics released by the rating site uh, Simago, which measures uh, scientific impact based on the number of citations per paper published in top quality journals. So we have some numbers here, right? I'm looking at the, some of the scientists. They're going to see if these numbers hold up. So. Whitehead is ranked number one in the world for the last decade in the category uh, excellence with leadership. Now, what does excellence with leadership mean? It means that when a Whitehead scientist is the lead author on a paper, that paper is more likely to end up in the top 1% of most cited papers than for any other institution in the world. And this has been the case for 10 years running. Um, or take, for example, the fact that of our 17 faculty members, three have been awarded the National Medal of Science, our nation's high, highest scientific honor bestowed by the President of the United States. Five are Howard Hughes Medical Investigators. And nine are members of the National Academy of Sciences. These are ratios without equal in the scientific community. And in addition to publishing the most influential papers in the world as serving as leaders in our fields, Whitehead scientists also develop fundamental knowledge that leads to new therapies and cures. Now, while we don't always boast about it, research at Whitehead has made an outsized contribution to the biotech economy here in Massachusetts. Um, I think it's fun to look back at a photo of Main Street here uh, in the early 1980s when Whitehead Institute was being built. Now, for those of you who like to identify, uh, let's see, oops, sorry. The, uh, for those of you who like to identify uh, automobiles, I was trying to pick, pick out uh, what this fine, uh, but, uh, if you, if you take a close look at this, uh, at this photograph, you will see the land on which uh, quite a few well, now well-known biotech firms and such are based. And it's uh, nothing but uh, sort of a lunar landscape at that time. Uh, <clears throat> so, but let's fast forward now from what it looked like when the Whitehead Institute, when the foundations of this building were being built to uh, a map of an incredible ecosystem that has since grown up around us. Um, the biotechs, the pharmaceutical companies, and actually just so you're, if you don't see the arrow, here's, here's the Whitehead Institute, and in blue are the names of uh, uh, all the biotech firms and actually uh, IT firms in, in red uh, around the landscape that have come into uh, existence or appearance since, since this uh, building opened. So it's an incredible ecosystem that's grown up around us, uh, biotech firms, pharmaceutical companies, and venture firms that surround us 
uh, <clears throat> because they know that this is the number one place in the world for biomedical discovery. Here is a list of some of the public and some of the private companies that were founded with the help of Whitehead faculty and Whitehead discoveries. And I will now touch on just a few of the therapeutics that have had their roots in fundamental research uh, conducted here at Whitehead Institute. Whitehead member Bob Weinberg, where's, there's Bob in the front row, we'll he be hearing from him in a few minutes. Uh, he's slinking down though. Uh, <laughs> Uh, Bob's lab discovered the cancer-causing gene NU, uh, now often referred to as HER2, uh, which revolutionized our understanding of the origins of cancer. This basic discovery uh, led others to study further the gene and its overexpression in breast cancer, ultimately leading to the development of Herceptin, the first targeted chemotherapy drug. Chronic myelogenous leukemia, or CML, was the first malignancy to be linked to a clear genetic abnormality, where parts of two chromosomes get stitched back together in a new combination, where parts of two chromosomes switch places. Former Whitehead fellow George Daly, when he was a graduate student in the lab of Whitehead founding director David Baltimore, confirmed in 1990 that two genes together known as the bcr able fusion were the molecular culprits responsible for CML. In 1988, the Lodish lab, the lab of Hardy v. Lodish, accomplished pioneering work on erythropoietin, or EPO, a hormone that controls the production of red blood cells. The lab, uh, Harvey's lab, identified and cloned the EPO receptor. EPO is the primary target of the drug EPOGEN that's produced by Amgen. Uh, Tefamidus. Uh, familial amyloid polyneuropathy is a rare but deadly neurodegenerative disease. Uh, <clears throat> The drug Tefamidus was, was developed at FoldRx Pharmaceuticals, a company founded by Susan Linquist of Whitehead Institute, together with Jeffrey Kelly of Scripps. FoldRx was acquired by Pfizer in 2010. <clears throat> Linzus for irritable bowel syndrome. Peter Hecht, a postdoc in the lab of Jerry Fink, founded a company called Ironwood in 2012. The FDA approved Ironwood's first therapy, Linzus, which treats irritable bowel syndrome with constipation, a condition that affects as many as uh, 10 million people in the United States alone. So, so who are these scientists who are publishing the top papers and contributing to the founding of companies and the development of new drugs? Today's Whitehead laboratories are led by 17 distinguished faculty members, four fellows, and our labs are populated by over 300 postdocs and grad students who are our trainees. These scientists are quite literally doing the research that will change the way that you, your children, and your grandchildren will experience health and disease. So let me tell you about just a few of our pioneering scientists who have received recognitions in the past year. Let me start with Mary Gehring, who is a Whitehead member who joined our faculty five years ago and uses a plant, the small plant Arabidopsis, to study changes in gene expression that we refer to as epigenetics. Mary is a Pew Scholar. She's a recipient of the Rosalind Franklin Young Investigator Award. And last May, the journal Cell recognized Mary as one of the world's most promising young scientists when it featured her as one of their 40 under 40. Um, Rudolf Janisch, another of our founding faculty, is one of the world's leading researchers in stem cell biology. Rudolf is a pioneer in the study of cellular reprogramming, the process of converting adult cells 
to induced pluripotent cells or iPS cells. In 2007, Rudolph's lab was one of the first three laboratories worldwide to report reprogramming of skin cells, uh, reprogramming skin cells from a mouse into iPS cells. And Rudolph's lab has since shown therapeutic benefits of iPS uh, cell-based treatments for sickle cell anemia and Parkinson's disease in laboratory animals. And just this year, Rudolph won the March of Dimes Prize in Developmental Biology. He also was awarded the Otto Warburg Medal, adding to what I can tell you is an incredibly uh, lengthy and impressive list of awards. He's now the third Whitehead member to receive the Otto Warburg Medal. Bob Weinberg was the 2007 recipient, and Susan Linquist, the 2008 recipient. Speaking, um, speaking of Susan Linquist, uh, this past summer, Susan was inducted into the United Kingdom's Royal Society. It's actually hard from across the pond to be inducted into the Royal Society, um, where she was recognized for transforming our understanding of how protein folding shapes biological systems and for her groundbreaking contributions in genetics and cell biology and biochemistry. And as many of you know, Susan uses yeast cells as living test tubes uh, to investigate abnormal protein folding. This is a toxic process that's been implicated in neurodegenerative diseases like Alzheimer's, Parkinson's, and uh, ALS. In addition to her induction into the Royal Society, Susan also in this last year received the prestigious Vanderbilt Prize in Biomedical Science. And let me return to one of our, um, actually our newest faculty member, Jinka Wang. Uh, he was the newest faculty member to join the Whitehead Institute just uh, two years ago. And he's already been the recipient of numerous awards. He, like Mary, who I mentioned at the beginning, is a Pew Scholar. Uh, Jinka has the, uh, for those in the know, has the most unusual distinction of being both a Pew Scholar and a Cyril Scholar. Um, and last winter, Jinka was named the winner of the Tansley Medal for Excellence in Plant Science. It's essentially recognizing sort of uh, one individual year who looks to be among the most up and coming young scientists in, in the area of, of plant research. In addition to our 17 faculty, we also have a very special group of young investigators who come to us right after graduate school and are given the opportunity to bypass the postdoctoral phase of training and immediately create independent research agendas. Set up their own laboratory, begin to make their own mistakes. Um, it's really critical to be able to start making mistakes at a very young age. Um, and speaking of our fellows, I'm not kidding, that's what it's all about in this business. Um, uh, speaking of our fellows, it gives me tremendous uh, pride to announce that last winter, we welcomed our newest uh, Whitehead fellow, uh, Sylvie Ruskin. And I should add that Sylvie is our uh, second Andrea and Paul Hafey fellow. We're so grateful to Andrea and Paul for continuing to support and nurture this important program. Uh, so uh, I, I, uh, Sylvie is going to be here during the, during the course of the day. And I would encourage you, if you see this person, I would encourage you to, um, to greet her and welcome her to Whitehead. Um, so please say hello there. Um, <clears throat> there are a few other people. Uh, I, I, should, I should tell you that just so when you run into Sylvie, just so you're well informed, I, I would encourage you to speak with her during the breaks and ask her about her exciting work on the structure of RNAs in living cells. Okay, so you all know about DNA makes RNA makes protein, but you may not have really, and you've heard a lot about protein structure. Ask Sylvie about RNA having structure in living cells. Um, <clears throat> there are a few other people who've made um, <clears throat> some particularly generous gifts over the last year, and I would like to take a minute to thank them. Um, Arthur Brill and Carol Tobin 
I'm sorry you couldn't be with us here today, but I want to thank you for your extraordinary generosity that has allowed us to create a new postdoctoral fellowship in my own laboratory. So thank you to Arthur and Carol. And uh, uh, Lenny and, and Mendy Balkan, um, I want to thank you for your extraordinary generosity that's allowed us to create new, postdoc uh, new postdoctoral fellowships in the labs of Hazel Siv and Susan Linquist to study brain health from yeast to zebrafish to human cells. It's through gifts like this uh, <clears throat> that the most cutting edge research can take place. So thank you very much. I've given you a a bit of a recent history lesson about Whitehead Institute. Now let's talk about what's in store for today. The title of the 2015 colloquium is, When Will We See a Cure for Cancer? Now we're pleased to have um, WBUR-FM as our media partner for, for this year's colloquium. And some of you may have heard announcements of today's event on your morning drive during the past two weeks. Uh, thank you, WBUR, for being a terrific partner. And as many of you know, Whitehead Institute has been at the vanguard of cancer research since its founding in 1982. So if that was the case in 1982, why should cancer be the focus of this year's program? What took us so long? Well, we're entering a very special time for cancer research at Whitehead Institute. Four faculty members, four of our 17 faculty, Rick Young, Bob Weinberg, David Sabatini, Piyush Gupta, those four faculty are now joining forces to develop a new approach for the deadliest cancers. And this collaboration is exciting for three reasons. First, it brings together four labs with very different perspectives and approaches. I'd say Whitehead is one of those rare places, perhaps the only place, where such diverse labs would work so closely and collaborative, collaboratively with one another. Uh, Rick Young, who we'll be hearing from, is an expert on gene regulation. David Sabatini is a world leader in cell metabolism. Bob Weinberg, Piyush Gupta study very different aspects of what makes certain cancers so aggressive. So the bringing together is number one. Second reason, this initiative is so exciting because it offers a new way to combat resistance. Resistance to therapy is one of the principal reasons people succumb to cancer. And we think we have an answer. And finally, this initiative comes in a moment when the tools that biologists have, when the tools that we have at our disposal have made research so efficient that we can go from basic research in the lab uh, to potential drugs in the clinic in uh, much abbreviated time. So you'll be hearing much more about the new Whitehead Cancer Initiative, which we call Treating the Untreatable, after the coffee break. So to help provide some context and perspective on the current state of cancer research, we have invited four of Boston's leading authorities on cancer to share their thoughts and engage in deep discussion with one another. So it gives me tremendous pleasure to announce that uh, Jay Bradner and Kim Stegmeier, a physician scientist at the Dana-Farber, will be sharing their insights as part of our panel. They'll be asking, when will we see a cure for cancer? Uh, joining. Jay and Kim, our Whitehead faculty member, Bob Weinberg, who's been slinking down in his seat as I've just talked about him, and also Whitehead research scientist, Luke Whitesill. Serving as moderator for this panel and the day as a whole is none other than Tom Ashbrook, a host of NPR's On Point. It's a great honor to welcome Tom to Whitehead Institute. I know he will help us digest, debate, and understand and make sense of the issues at hand. But before I introduce Tom, I want to give a very warm welcome to our kickoff speaker, uh, Joyce Colhaywick. Joyce is best known 
as the Emmy Award winning arts and entertainment critic for CBS Boston. She's currently lending her expertise as an arts critic and advocate, motivational speaker, and cancer crusader. Joyce is president of the Boston Theater Critics Association. She's a member of the Boston Society of Film Critics and Boston Online Film Critics uh, Association. She's covered local and national events from Boston and Broadway to Hollywood, reporting live from the Oscars, the Emmys, the Grammys, and uh, closer to the point of today, uh, Joyce is a three times cancer survivor. She's testified before Congress um, on the 20th anniversary of the National Cancer Act, and for over 25 years, she's chaired the American Cancer Society's largest spring fundraising campaign, which I'm sure you are all familiar with, Daffodil Days. Um, the ACS has honored Colhewick with uh, its National Bronze Medal for her work. So please join me in giving a very warm welcome to Joyce Colhewick. Good morning. It is uh, really wonderful to be here. And when you hear the rest of my remarks, you'll understand that it's wonderful for me to be anywhere. And, um, and actually, I'm, I'm uh, first of all, thank you so much. It's uh, really overwhelming to be in such company among such brilliant, distinguished scientists, such generous donors, uh, and people who are all engaged in this same struggle. I want to thank Whitehead for discovering me, for reaching out to me and bringing me here. Nothing happens by chance, and I know that's something you all believe in here in Whitehead. Um, and, and normally, um, I wouldn't be doing anything like this at this time, because for me, this is an ungodly hour. Uh, I, I worked the 11 o'clock news for so many years, and that was, that was wonderful. So it was all I could do to not show up here this morning in my pajamas. Uh, so hold that image in your head, will you, as I talk. Uh, and you all look amazing. I've never seen this many shirts and ties and jackets. Honestly, nobody wears this stuff anymore. You, cra <laughs> you crazy scientists. And Bob Weinberg, sit up in your chair, OK? <laughs> forgive me. Forgive me for taking the liberty. Um, I really wanted to be here this morning to tell you what I know. And I have no charts or graphs. I have no deep science. Um, but I, I can tell you that what I know about Whitehead seems to embody everything I believe in and everything that I have experienced on my own journey with this disease. Uh, and that is a kind of, um, what I've discovered here, a kind of renegade spirit, a healthy skepticism for institutional thinking, a really deep commitment to going wherever and however deeply the truth leads you. And that the truth can be found in unexpected places when we don't know when it's coming or where and how. And one needs to be able to feel spontaneous and alive to those moments of epiphany, I guess we could call them. So all I can do this morning is share with you what I've learned as a three-time cancer survivor and hope that um, Maybe something that I say, because I think that this is how things really do happen, might ring a bell or strike a chord and might take you someplace that you didn't expect to go. I believe that uh, with cancer particularly, early prognosis is maybe the big, uh, excuse me, early diagnosis, see it's early for me, early diagnosis is perhaps the biggest single prognosticator of how a patient will do. It's certainly a key element. So I believe that healing for the patient begins not with the doctor and not with the scientist. We need you. But it begins, I believe, with the patient. And so I found myself um, a three-time cancer survivor. This is a fate that uh, I had no reason to expect. There was almost no cancer in my family. I was a very healthy, uh, normal, no serious illnesses, uh, non-smoker, non-drinker, not a crazy exerciser, but just an all-around healthy person. When suddenly, <laughs> and this is how it began, I was watching television, and I was watching, it was 1979, it was about a week before I was getting married. 
and I was watching TV and I had the Phil Donahue show on. Do you remember Phil Donahue? He's the guy who invented Oprah, basically. And uh, Phil Donahue was on, he used to have all these incredible guests on, and he had a woman on who said she had cancer of the colon and it all started with a mole on her leg. And I looked down and on my leg is a mole that had suddenly appeared and had been there for about a year and I didn't do anything about it. In fact, I thought it was kind of sexy. A number of people said, oh, that's kind of cute. I mean, of all things, now we know, you know, if it's a mole, run. But in 1979, I didn't know anything, but for some reason, this did ring a bell for me. And I thought, you know, I really ought to check that out. So because it's on my skin, I went to a dermatologist. And the dermatologist looked at it and said, oh, that doesn't look like anything. And I said, well, I am getting married in about a week, and I want to know for sure what this is. I would like a biopsy, and I knew that word. I want a biopsy, I said. I was always kind of pushy and aggressive about certain things, like what I want. <laughs> Talk to my husband. We're still married. Um, and he said, well, we could do a biopsy. And I said, great. He said, but you know, we won't get the results for 10 days. I said, well, that's not possible because I really, I'm going on my honeymoon, I'm getting married, and I need to have those results right away. He said, well, you have to carry it over to the lab yourself. I said, hey, no problem. So we removed half the mole, which I guess in hindsight was probably not a good idea. Um, and he popped it in a jar. And I remember walking through the Chestnut Hill Mall with this you know, piece of tissue floating around in some kind of solution. And I walked it over to the Chestnut Hill Medical Center and delivered it, and that was it. Until two days later, when this dermatologist's um, boss, I guess, called me at work at Evening Magazine. I was working at Evening Magazine at the time, hosted by Robin Young and Marty Sender, a long time ago. And I picked up the phone, and the doctor says to me, we are 99% sure you have malignant melanoma, there are going to be brain scans, liver scans, et cetera. Uh, you're going to have to check yourself into a hospital. I said, what are you telling me? I, he never used the word cancer, so I had no idea. But he used the word malignant, which I associated with cancer. And I said, are you telling me I have some kind of cancer? He said, yes. And so I kind of delivered the diagnosis to myself in a way. And uh, I said, well, wait a minute. I, I don't have any uh, insurance. I was freelancing. Is this going to be expensive? He said, oh, yes, it's going to be very expensive. I said, well, I'm getting married. He said, no, 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 you're not getting married. You're going into the hospital. And I said, well, is this, is this going to be painful? He said, oh, yeah, gr skin grafts. I mean, it was all the way. And I just about collapsed. Robin Young had to finish the conversation for me. I went home and started packing for the hospital. And that night, uh, the other piece of this story is not only was I getting married, but I was getting married at a double wedding with my brother and his future bride. And uh, she happened to be the chief radiation therapist at University Hospital. How's that for luck? And she said to me, Joyce, you need a second opinion. And I said, a second opinion? What, is there really going to be a conversation about this? I mean, could there be some question about this being cancer? It didn't even occur to me such a thing was possible. She said, trust me, you need to see another doctor. I've already set it up. She set me up with a meeting with a Dr. Peter Deckers at University Hospital, a saint on earth with whom I am still in touch. And he saw me the next morning at 7.30, looked at me, looked at the slides. Everything had been gotten over there. And he said, OK, I'm going to give you the good news and the bad news. The bad news is this is a very vicious and aggressive tumor, and it spreads rather rapidly. For a whatever reason, the good news is, I think we caught it in time. But whatever we do, we're going to have to consider saving your life first. That's got to come off right now. Can you handle a local anesthetic? I said, you bet. He takes me in there, and I'm thinking he's preparing me for amputation, but I really didn't even care. He wheels me in, puts up the sheet, injects me with all this stuff to numb me up. Forgive my scientific description here. Um, and then staples me up with 17 stitches. And I said, can I get married? He said, oh, yeah, you can get married. We're going to check back in, in about three weeks. And I limped down the aisle with 17 stitches in my leg, which uh, the doctor then gave my husband a staple remover, I'm calling it. <laughs> and he said, you're going to take these stitches out, which my husband did in a hotel room in Barcelona on our honeymoon. And boy, was it romantic. <laughs> <laughs>
So I go back to the doctor, and the uh, results are the rest of what they removed was 95, was, um, was shallower than the first part. This doctor was not only a, a, a surgeon, but an oncological specialist, and he specialized in melanoma, and he, do, he knew more than my dermatologist knew. And he knew that if you got a melanoma, they were sort of on the cusp of this information. If you, if you detected a melanoma at a certain depth, that perhaps one didn't need to uh, have all one's lymph nodes removed and be left scarred and limping, which is what would have happened to me had I not pursued that second opinion. There was more information out there, I guess I'm saying, to get, and I had no idea. So I thought, okay, wow, that was my brush with cancer. Unbelievable. Until about 10 years later, when I'm in my room doing one of the maybe five yoga workouts I've done in my entire life. And I finish this yoga, and uh, I realize I'm freezing cold. And I thought, oh, I forgot to put the thermostat up. And I look at the thermostat, and it's up. I'm cold. And suddenly, within about five minutes, I started getting feverish, chills, and then violent abdominal pain. I got into a car, drove to the nearest hospital, got in the door. The nurses said I looked almost green, like I was going to pass out. They checked me into the hospital. They put me on intravenous antibiotics for about a week, checked me out, and gave me a clean bill of health and said I had some sort of infection. Great, except that I felt I wasn't well. I know that when I'm well, I'm really resilient, and I, and I feel really well, and I didn't feel, and it wasn't anything specific, but I didn't feel my full, vibrant self. And I noticed that I might be a tad swollen, but you know, I was 35 years old, and I thought, well, that's how this starts. You know, you start to get a little wide around the middle or whatever. And I had a friend with me, and I said, and she knew me a long time, and I said, look at me. Is this normal for me? And she said, no, that's not normal for you. I called another doctor. She said, that doesn't sound right. Checked me into another hospital. They looked at me and said, yep, it's your appendix, and it's got to come right out. They wheeled me into the operating room, opened me up, and it was not my appendix. It was ovarian cancer. And it was ovarian cancer on one side, stage 1A. They removed the tumor, left everything else in, and that was a disease, that was a decision that actually almost cost me my life. They said to come back after I had my family, and then they would do a complete hysterectomy. I never had that chance. About a year and a half later, didn't conceive. I find myself on an airplane headed to Nairobi on a safari vacation. And just as we're coming in for a landing, I start being racked with abdominal pain. And I'm thinking, oh no, is this the flu? Is this cancer? Do I fly all the way back home? Do I check myself into a hospital in Nairobi? What do I do? I hold up in a hotel for a couple of days. My body seemed to take care of itself. We did the whole safari. We hiked into the Virunga Mountains. We met the mountain gorillas. We hacked our way through the jungle. It was an amazing trip. I got back. I went to the doctor. They said, oh, we think you have pancreatitis. I said, you're kidding. You don't think it? No, it's pancreatitis, we're sure. They checked me into a hospital. They did a blood test called CA-125, which is a marker for me for ovarian cancer. It's not a diagnostic tool. It gives false positives and false negatives, but we knew that for me it was a marker. Um, five days I stayed, I left, they got the results back and said, no, your CA-125 is through the roof. We think this is something serious. We're scheduling you for sur surgery. They scheduled me for surgery, I didn't make it. The night before the surgery, again, racked with abdominal pain, they rushed me in, opened me up, and now time, there's a tumor in there that is ruptured three times. And this was a tumor that we, I had actually been looking for just before we left on the trip. I remember thinking something wasn't right, and we went in and did a little laparoscopy, and they removed a couple of cells, and they said, they're slightly abnormal, but no big deal. Everybody has abnormal cells. These are not going to be cancerous. We were looking and could not find. This was really tough. Ovarian cancer is tricky. Full-blown ruptured tumor. They removed everything. I did six months of chemotherapy. They told me my hair would fall out. It did not. They were wrong pretty much about everything. 
uh, except that ultimately they saved my life, and it was the people at the Dana-Farber Cancer Institute, and my, my chemotherapist was an absolute um, angel on earth. I knew that when she walked into the room, I would be fine somehow. And then when I was through with the course of treatment, I thought, you know, I want to know if I'm okay. I want to go back in and I want a second look surgery, which was done on occasion. And almost all of my doctors said, no, we're not doing that because if you're fine, you're fine. And if you're not fine, there's nothing else we can do for you. And I said, you know what? I want to know if I'm fine, because who knows what I will do. Maybe I'll take Chinese herbs. Maybe I'll give up meat, red meat. Maybe I will do, you don't know, I don't know, but I'd rather see what's coming so that I know. And Dr. Peter Deckers and I consulted, and he said, if you were my wife, we would go in there and we would look. And we did, and I had him do the operation with all of my doctors, this body on the table, in one room with everybody. And they opened me up, and I was totally fine, completely free and clear. And um, that was 27 years ago, and I am still standing here. The doctors have said, you know, we could count on the fingers of one hand the people that fall into this category with those diseases. So what did I learn? I learned so many things. And I want to go back to something that I read uh, that David Page said so many years ago in an article. They sent me a whole thing on you. I know all your darkest secrets. He said that growing up, he had no idea he would become a scientist, but that he had a large appreciation for the role of chance and that everything in his life he'd sort of fallen into. This I have always believed. I have always taken this to heart, and I have always believed that all things are possible. We just have to figure out how. And I think that is the fundamental spirit and the culture of what happens here at the Whitehead Institute. It's what kept me asking questions when I was getting answers that did not seem right to me because I had some rather unscientific sense that I was not well. I would tell anybody here, and this is what I learned, to always ask, to always push, to always trust your body first. You live in your body, you inhabit yourself, and you know it better than anybody else. Once you know what's happening with you, you need to find a doctor who will hear you, who will hear you, who's really listening and attuned. And when you find that person, that is the beginning of the healing. And if you are not happy with that person, and you will know when you found that person because you will feel safe with that person, and you will feel like things are opening up, you will just know. And if you're not comfortable, get a second opinion. Good doctors welcome second opinions and will facilitate second opinions. Don't be afraid to challenge a doctor. Doctors who are good doctors welcome these challenges, and we need to own ourselves. If a doctor makes an error, we pay the price and not the doctor. Everybody needs to know and remember that, that we are the stewards of ourselves, and it really is up to us to push and bring a team of people in there when you go in. You know, I used to bring in my mother, my brother, my husband. We'd ask questions. When I would be overwhelmed with something, somebody else would have something. We'd go back and digest. This is what one needs to do. And then remember that when you're fighting hard, that always there is some new drug, some new treatment, some new therapy around the corner. Like I was on the cusp of this information about melanoma that I had no idea about. And that is what we need Whitehead for, the some new drug, the some new treatment, the some new therapy that's going to come from some unexpected source and is the result of a lot of hard work and intellectual insight and expertise. Um, I'm thinking about the Whitehead Institute and the way it operates. And I'm thinking about something that the Dalai Lama said about spiritual detachment being the road to empathy and enlightenment. And I think that what goes on here at Whitehead is sort of like scientific detachment, that there is an openness and a willingness to collaborate in a spontaneous way 
so that whatever can happen will happen. I think that's the way in which Whitehead kind of keeps the ecosystem alive and gives us the medical ecosystem alive and keeps us aware of new ways of thinking and understanding how the world and life really works. I also learned that there's a tremendous font of love and support out there for everybody. I got help from so many people I didn't even know. And again, that takes me back to the Whitehead Institute. You are working around the clock on so many fronts to save our lives. You are healing us. We feel it. We know it. And just that vibe is out there taking care of business, as it were. I just want to wish all of you a beautiful day of discovery. To anybody out there who's dealing with this disease, either in yourself, um, a family member, uh, if you've just lost somebody, please know that you are not alone, that there are many people in this world helping, that we are all in this thing together. And it is a privilege to be able to talk to you and be among you this morning. I wish you a beautiful day. Thank you. Thank you.